hello. <laughs> and welcome to this book event. I'm glad you guys all made it up here. Um, as we found out when we got here, Lynn manuel Miranda is actually going to be here like in an hour. I was just in the room with all where he's going to be signing all of his books, and I signed a bunch of them to help him out. Um, <laughs> people are going to be very surprised. Um, so thank you very, very much for coming out. This is the official launch event for the paperback, um, which we got a paperback even, which is like in and of itself, like kind of a cool thing. Um, and I just want to thank all of you guys so much for your support with the hardback and your support for coming out now today, because obviously because the we put it on the New York Times bestseller list, which I was thrilled uh, about. And I want to thank you guys all for that, because then when I went, uh, my little public, my publishing team is here. Hi, publishing team, wave your hands. That's my publishing team back there. It's my editor and my agent, uh, my publicist, um, marketing director. And because this book did so well, that then when I pitched them the next book, they were like, yeah, we definitely want to buy that. And now I live in Paris. Um, so really, thank you guys so much, because uh, now, I'm, now I'm there with the, my wife and, their, and my kids are back there. <sighs> All alone. But OK, so I do not want to do just a, a reading from the book. You guys have either all hopefully read the book or you're planning on reading the book. You don't need me to read the book to you. Um, but what I do want to do is read from the author's note because the author's note explains sort of why I wrote the book in the first place. Um, and then we can talk around uh, what the Romans were dealing with uh, when they emerged from, uh, when they emerged as the strongest power in the Mediterranean in the mid second century BC and how that might relate to where the United States of America, for example, finds itself at the dawn of the 21st century. So if you thought you were going to get out of this without reading the author's note, <laughs> you guys all read the author's note, right? You did all read the author's note. Okay, so I'm just going to bore the crap out of you now. Okay, here we go. No period in Roman history has been more thoroughly studied than the fall of the Roman Republic. The names Caesar, Pompey, Cicero, Octavian, Mark Antony, and Cleopatra are among the most well-known names, not just in Roman history, but in human history. Each year we are treated to a new book, movie, or TV show depicting the lives of this vaunted last generation of the Roman Republic. And there are good reasons for their continued predominance. It is a period alive with fascinating personalities and earth-shattering events. It is especially riveting for those of us in the modern world who, suspecting the fragility of our own Republican institutions, look to the rise of the Caesars as a cautionary tale. Ben Franklin's famous remark that the Constitutional Convention had produced a republic, if you can keep it, which we discussed in Revolutions episode 2.16, 2.16 is what that's from, <laughs> rings all these generations later as a warning bell. Surprisingly, there has been much less written about the, how the Roman Republic came to the brink of disaster in the first place, a question that is perhaps more relevant today than ever. A raging fire naturally commands attention, but to prevent future fires, one must ask how the fire started. No revolution springs out of thin air. And I mean, we know that, right? No revolution springs out of thin air. Every revolution springs out of six to eight episodes of background. <laughs> when I explain demographic trends and you know the interest rates on government bonds <laughs> before we get to the bang, bang, shoot, shoot stuff. Um, and the, the head chopping off. Okay, so no revolution springs out of thin air. No, it most certainly does not. Uh, and the political system that Julius Caesar destroyed through sheer force of ambition certainly was not healthy to begin with. Much of the fuel that ignited in the 40s and 30s BC had been poured a century earlier. The critical generation that preceded that of Caesar, Cicero, and Antony, that of the revolutionary Gracchi brothers, excuse me, the stubbornly ambitious Marius and the infamously brash Sulla is neglected. We have long been denied a story that is as equally thrilling, chaotic, frightening, hilarious, and riveting as that of the final generation of the Republic. And this book tells that story. But this book does not simply serve as a way to fill a hole in our knowledge of Roman history. While producing the history of Rome, I was asked the same set of questions over and over again. Is America Rome? Is the United States following a similar historical trajectory? If so, where does the United States stand on the Roman timeline? Attempting to make a direct comparison between Rome and the United States is always fraught with danger, 
but that does not mean there is no value to entertaining the question. It at least behooves us to identify where in the thousand year history of the Roman Empire we might find an analogous historical setting. I, I wonder what period that might be. Um, in that vein, let's explore this because we are not in the origin phase where a collection of exiles and dissidents and vagabonds migrate to a new territory and establish a permanent settlement. That would correspond to the early colonial days. Nor are we in the revolutionary phase where a group of disgruntled aristocrats overthrow the monarchy and create a republic. That corresponds to the days of the Founding Fathers. And we are not in the global conquest phase, where a series of wars against other great powers establishes international, military, political, and economic hegemony. That would be the 20th century global conflicts of World War I, World War II, and the Cold War. Finally, despite what some hysterical commentators may claim, the Republic has not collapsed and been taken over by a dictator. Yet. <laughs> I wrote this like two and a half years ago. <laughs> I was much more confident <laughs> two and a half years ago when I wrote that sentence. Um, further investigation into this period reveals an era full of historical echoes that will sound eerily familiar to the modern reader. The final victory over Carthage in the Punic Wars led to rising economic inequality, the dislocation of traditional ways of life, increasing political polarization, the breakdown of unspoken rules of political conduct, the privatization of the military, rampant corruption, endemic social and ethnic prejudice, uh, battles over access to citizenship and voting rights, ongoing military quagmires, the introduction of violence as a political tool, and a set of elites so obsessed with their own privileges that they refuse to reform the system in time to save it. <sighs> These echoes could be mere coincidence, of course, but the great Greek biographer Plutarch certainly believed it possible that, quote, if on the other hand, there is a limited number of elements from which events are interwoven, the same things must happen many times, being brought to pass by the same agencies. So if history is to have any active meaning, there must be a place for identifying those interwoven elements, studying the recurring agencies, and learning from those who came before us. The Roman Empire has always been and will always be fascinating in its own right, and this book is most especially a narrative of a particular epoch of Roman history. But if our age carries with it many of those limited number of elements being brought to pass by the same agencies, then this particular period of Roman history is well worth deep investigation, contemplation, and reflection. So with that, let us contemplate and reflect on this particular epoch of Roman history. So the author's note covers basically the two reasons why I wrote this book. The first is that it is wildly and mysteriously undercovered um, in terms of nonfiction books that have been written about it, in terms of TV shows that are made about it, which there haven't been any TV shows about it. I would know, I'm trying to sell one right now. Um, <laughs> If you know anybody in Hollywood, tell them to call me. Um, that this is a, a period that is just alive. It's got towering historical figures. I mean, Marius and Sulla are not just some of the most important leaders in the history of the Roman Republic, but in the whole history of the Roman Empire, the whole thousand years uh, run of the empire, um, they are grappling with some of the deepest social, political, and economic issues that the Romans ever had to deal with. Um, there are huge climactic battles that involve troop numbers that are amongst the largest that the Romans had ever fought. And then the whole back third of the book climaxes with a civil war, a massive civil war that consumes Italy that almost destroys the Roman Republic right then and there when Caesar is still like 16, 17 years old. So it's mysteriously not covered. Um, on top of that, not only is the period itself fascinating and alive with rich characters and, and events, it's the prelude to what I say is arguably one of the most studied periods in all of human history, which is the collapse of the Roman Republic. I mean, Julius Caesar is famous not just in you know, the Western canon, but he's studied in China, he's studied in India. This is, this is an event that is, uh, that is incredibly important. And to jump into the era of Julius Caesar and Antony and Cleopatra and Octavia, um, 
to jump into that without studying the beginnings of it is like jumping into a movie in the middle of the third act or at the beginning of the third act where you know everybody's running around everybody's shooting each other there's obviously like big climactic things happening but you have no idea how any of the characters got here in the first place um so going back and looking at what books might possibly exist out there that that uh, that the storm before the storm would be in competition with there were really none that had ever focused on the beginning of the end of the Roman Republic right everybody studies the end of the end of the Roman Republic so I'm like let's study the beginning of the end of the Roman Republic so that's just one thing the other side of it is of course this comparison to where the United States and kind of where the West generally finds itself uh, at the beginning of the 21st century. And, you know, if you go too deep into the granular detail, uh, you know, the analogy is going to start to break down. But if you unfocus your eyes a little bit, we do find the Romans dealing with many of the same issues that we are dealing with today. And we know how it ended for the Romans. It did not end well for the Romans. Um, so if history is gonna have an active meaning, then we should go back and look at what the Romans did right in this period, which is not much. <laughs> and we should look at what they did wrong, which was like a lot. And we should learn from their example. We should learn from their mistakes. So for the rest of tonight, what I wanna do is talk about where the Romans found themselves at the beginning of the second century BC. So maybe we can stop our own beginning of the end of the Republic from leading to an end of the end of the Republic. And before I go on, did any, how many people played the silly little promotional, can you save the Roman Republic? Nice. Where's, is Miguel here? He'd left? Oh, okay. Miguel is the, Miguel is the, the digital director. He's the one who, oh, wait, well, wait a sec. Oh God. Hey, how's it going? You want to know where oh, I'll send you the link. Um, so that a lot, a lot of what came out of, did, did everybody save the Republic or did everybody die or get exiled? You, yeah, you were supposed to die or get exiled. It was supposed to be very hard to save the Republic. You save the Republic, save the Republic. A very good, 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 good. Okay. You read the book. Um, <laughs> and you probably know me a little bit and you're like, I should just stop taking credit for things and maybe then I can win. Um, so the single most destabilizing element that enters into Roman society and Roman culture after they emerge from the victories over Carthage in the Punic Wars is skyrocketing economic inequality. It is the, the, the amount of wealth that is going to start to pour into uh, Italy and into Rome uh, in the middle of the second century BC is just sums of astronomical proportions compared to what the Romans had been controlling before. Um, and the, the, there is a point to be made here though that there were always rich people and poor people in Rome. There was always a senatorial aristocracy. There were always poor plebs. Um, there are rich people and poor people in most societies. The difference here is that the gap between rich and poor was beginning to widen. It was, and it was widening rapidly. It was widening year after year after year. So when the Romans went out a conquering, uh, they sent their legions to Spain, they sent their legions to Greece, they, they're in North Africa, they're up into Southern Gaul. And as they conquer various cities and various tribes and various kingdoms, the legions are coming back and there are baggage trains that are coming back with, with the legions. And then all this stuff is gonna be displayed in the, the consul's triumph. You're talking about recorded, uh, recorded triumphs where this consul brings back 80,000 pounds of silver, right? This consul brings back 500,000 gold pieces and 250,000 silver pieces and you know this, this many gold rubies and this much jewelry. Um, you're, you're literally talking about the specie and the coined money of the entire Mediterranean world is now being boxed up and hauled back to Rome as the spoils of war. So on top of that, once Rome becomes the strongest city in the Mediterranean world, uh, and you're, you're, when Rome at this point, you're, if you compare it to another city, if you compare it to Antioch or Rhodes or something, those are cities that are in, they're gonna be in the tens of thousands, right? That's how big one of those cities would be, tens of thousands, maybe 20,000. Rome was in the hundreds of thousands. And then as it moves on to the high imperial era, 
it's going to get to a point where Rome is a million people. I mean, a million people in a city in the ancient world. That is astronomically huge. So it becomes the center of uh, basically the Mediterranean trade networks that have been set up by the Phoenicians way back in the day. Um, so you have all of this wealth now circulating into Rome and all of it is being deposited in Rome. Um, but it is not being distributed equally to all Roman citizens, right? It is concentrated in the hands of the senatorial aristocracy. Uh, these guys are the consuls. They are the leaders. They control all of the priesthoods. They control all of the temples. Um, they are the generals out there in the field who are controlling the spoils of war and doling it out to their friends and fellow members uh, of their family. So the rich are getting richer, and they really, they really are dealing with uh, sums of money that are well beyond anything that their ancestors ever, ever could have imagined even controlling. But as the rich are getting richer, and as Rome itself is becoming more and more powerful, the poor are in fact getting poorer. They aren't just standing still. They aren't just you know treading water. They are actually, it, it is getting increasingly worse for them um, economically. One of the big reasons for this is the same wars of conquest um, are dragging men off to fight for years at a time. Now, in, in the early days of the Republic, uh, the, legions, the legions were basically a glorified seasonal militia where if you, had a, if you wanted to have a war with some neighbor, uh, you would go out, you would fight in the spring, you'd fight in the summer. Uh, if it hadn't been wrapped up by the time that uh, your fields needed to be harvested, everybody would break and go home and harvest their fields because no less than the Romans, their enemies were also like agrarian, you know, had, were running a, a, an agrarian economy and they had to go home and tend to their fields. And then if the war wasn't wrapped up by winter, everybody would just call a truce and pick it back up in the spring. This is why so many climactic battles uh, throughout history happen in October, in case you were wondering, because um, everybody's trying to wrap it up by winter. Um, but when you get into the Punic Wars, you start having guys getting hauled off for service for four years, five years, six years. They're staying in the country that they're fighting. And when they finally come back to Italy, they often found their own little plot of land um, in a dilapidated state. All the sons, all the brothers, the cousins, the uncles, the fathers, all of them are going off and fighting. When they come back, they simply don't have the resources to bring their land back up to a productive level, and certainly not to a productive level that is going to allow them to compete with their rich neighbors who are increasingly commercializing their estates and making them more productive and more profitable. So this runs these two groups into each other, the rich who are getting richer and the poor who are getting poorer, because the rich Romans, right, they have all this gold, they have all this silver, um, but the true measure of wealth in Rome is not gold and silver. These guys are not Scrooge McDuck. They do not go swimming in their money bins at night and fetishize little shiny trinkets. They want land. So they've got a, they've got a poor neighbor who can't keep his estates up. Well, hey, I'll give you some money and you sell me your plot of land and that'll be great. And then I'll buy this guy's plot of land and then I'll buy this guy's plot of land and then that guy, that guy doesn't want to sell me his plot of land so I'll send some guys to rough him up and then he'll want to sell me his plot of land. And this begins a process, about a hundred year long process, that turns Italy from a patchwork of small farms, of like small citizen farmers, uh, into these large, sprawling, commercially oriented latifundia. Okay, so now you've been, now you're a poor Roman and you have been dispossessed of your land. Um, so what can you do to, to hang on, right? Well, you can go enter into the labor market, right? There is a labor market. There's, there's a need for day laborers. There's a need for wage laborers in the city, right? Isn't there? <laughs> Not anymore. Because what is the other thing that the rich senatorial class is going to invest their land in once they've bought up a bunch of, or excuse me, what they're they going to invest their wealth in uh, once they've done with the land. It's slaves. slaves, of course. So this is the moment in Roman history when Rome goes from being a society with slaves, because all Mediterranean societies had some slaves, uh, and so Rome had slaves. But this is when it goes from being a society with slaves into a full-blown slave society where the bulk of the productive labor is being performed by 
slaves. And d the same way that the Romans, like Livy, would chronicle uh, the gold, the, the amount of gold and the amount of silver that somebody's bringing back, you would also say, and then the, you would also bring back 100,000 slaves from Gaul. You know, when Aemilius Paulus conquered, uh, conquered Greece after the Battle of Pydna, he's bringing back 300,000 slaves. All of these humans who have been enslaved are now also pouring into Italy. They're pouring into Sicily, and they are now doing the bulk of the productive labor. So these dispossessed poor Romans who have just lost the one little plot of land that had maybe been in their family for a couple generations now go out and find most of the work is being done by slaves. So this creates a lot of resentful and bitter energy out there because they knew that things were changing. They knew that their fathers and their grandfathers did not live this way and that something, something worse, they, they were living a worse life than their family had lived previously. And this is going to create an opportunity for a new style of popular politics to enter into the Roman bloodstream. So all of that, you can kind of sum all that up and say that right now there is, because of this increasing economic inequality, there's massive tension between rich and poor in Rome. But that is only one side of the story because there is this other conflict that is also brewing that becomes incredibly important, uh, which is the conflict between the Romans and the non-Roman Italians. Right? This is what's going to ultimately culminate in the social war, which kicks off the civil war that is ultimately won by Sulla. So the background, we, of course, we've all listened to the history of Rome, right? Listen to every episode of the history of Rome so you know the deal is that when they go off conquering during the Samnite Wars and they conquer a city or they conquer a tribe, uh, the Romans do not annex that territory outright into, into the Roman fold. They do not make those people citizens of Rome. They don't even really make them subjects of Rome. Uh, those cities sign treaties of alliance with Rome. They become merely allies of Rome. So at this point, it's not even, uh, it's not proper to call the non-Roman Italians second-class citizens because they are not even citizens at all. They are not citizens of Rome. Um, the only thing that the Romans ask of the Italians is troops for the legions, right? If a Roman magistrate comes down and says, hey, I'm gonna go fight a war, you have to give me so many guys. There's a quota that each city would have uh, about how many men they had to contribute to the legions. Uh, but other than that, the Romans did not really tax the Italians. There were no direct taxes on these quote unquote conquered cities. Uh, the Romans did not send prefects to govern these cities. They let the local elites continue to manage their own affairs just as they always had. and. This is actually a pretty good deal for the Italians for, for quite a long time. And it's one of the reasons why when Hannibal comes through the Alps and runs around Italy telling all these people, hey, you know, you were conquered by Rome and I'm here to liberate you. I'm here to save you. And the Italian, a lot of them were like, oh man, it's a fine. It's a pretty good deal. They don't <laughs> tax us. They don't, you know, don't tell us what to do. Are you going to tax us and tell us what to do? And Hannibal's probably, yeah, of, well, of course I would have conquered you. <laughs> They don't tax you. They don't tell you what to do. That's crazy. Um, so this is a this is a pretty good deal for like 200 years. But by this period in the mid second century BC, the the costs of not being a Roman citizen begin to outweigh the benefits of not being a Roman citizen because no less than their Roman cousins, um, the Italians were dealing with all of these same pressures, especially these economic pressures. Um, they were contributing men to the legions. Uh, about two thirds of any given Roman army is actually going to be made up of non-citizen Italians. So these guys are going off for three, four, five years at a stretch. They're coming back. They're finding their land dispossessed. They're finding their land in a dilapidated state. They're being bought out. They're being dispossessed. They're entering labor markets that are now flooded with slaves. But Unlike their Roman cousins, they don't even have the right to vote. They don't have the right to choose their own, to, to choose the people who are ostensibly in charge um, of this like military hegemony that they live under. And they are all subject to arbitrary abuse by Roman magistrates, which is something that not even the poorest Roman even has to face. Like a, like a consul could not come down and just beat a Roman citizen or accuse them of a crime or kill them without giving that citizen the right to appeal to the popular assembly, to appeal to the tribunes of the plebs. That's one of the reasons the tribunes of the plebs existed. Um, so 
after the great conquest of 146 BC, the Italians get it into their head that what they really want now to keep moving forward is they want citizenship in Rome. They want to be citizens of the Republic. For centuries, they have been an integrated part of the culture. They have been an integrated part of the military system. Their, uh, their traders are out there spreading the economic uh, reach and expanse of Rome. Their soldiers are out there spreading Rome's influence. So like, we want to be citizens. And this weirdly, however, this, this push for Italian citizenship, which starts up during the Gracchan era, like the Gracchi brothers are, are the first um, people to really propose, yeah, we should give uh, citizenship to the Italians. This is an issue that actually unites rich and poor Romans alike. They both resist uh, granting citizenship to the Italians. Now the rich, the rich senatorial class, it's pretty obvious like, why they wouldn't want anybody else because they're happy with their little position of power and privilege and they don't need anybody else coming in and mucking it up and, and having some different point of view. That doesn't sound very good. Um, but for the poor Romans, if we start to move into a place where land is going to be redistributed or there's going to be a subsidized grain dole, there is going to be a limited amount of land that's available or a limited amount of grain that is available. It's not, these are not unlimited resources. So you don't want a bunch of new citizens coming in and getting in the way of your own ability to get a plot of land to get your family back on the feet or to be able to access this subsidized grain. So anytime Italian citizenship is proposed throughout most of the course of the book, it's going to be resisted, but not just by the, the conservative aristocracy, also by uh, the lower class Romans as well. So all of this creates an opportunity for this new form of Roman politics to enter into the bloodstream, which is popular politics, populist politics, leaders who are going to go around and try to whip up votes by saying, uh, I know that you're struggling, I know that you have problems, and I'm going to solve your problems, I'm going to give you land, I'm going to give you subsidized grain, I am going to start new infrastructure projects that will allow you to work. Um, and all of this can be a powerful tool for a Roman leader. It was not anything that most Roman leaders had ever attempted before, but as much as we talk about the Roman Republic being merely uh, like a Senate, like a, an aristocratic oligarchy where the Senate called all the shots, uh, the popular assemblies were still quite powerful at this point. And if you could pack enough people into the voting stalls, then you could actually get things done and you could actually make yourself into a great and powerful leader, less by appealing to your conservative brethren in the Senate and more by appealing to the people. And initially, at least, I think that a lot of this popular politics and, and populist leaders were, in fact, genuinely interested in reform. And th there's, a, there's a big debate among historians about how cynical the Gracchi brothers were. were. Were they doing this for the good of the Republic? Were they doing this for their own narrow political self-interest? And at least for me, having read every scrap I could possibly find about all of this, is I really do think that the Gracchi brothers were interested in genuinely reforming uh, some of the things that they saw going wrong with the Republic. They certainly saw an imbalance that was entering into the Constitution, uh, where the senatorial aristocracy was wielding more power than they probably should. You do have people who used to have land, who used to qualify for service in the legions, who now didn't. You had people uh, inside the cities who were unable to feed them themselves. These were, these were real issues that Tiberius Gracchus and then especially, most especially Gaius Gracchus identified as things that needed to be solved. Now this is not, of course, to say that they were doing this altruistically. There is no altruism in Roman politics. Uh, there is no altruism in politics, right? Okay. No, nobody does anything in politics just because it's a good thing. Um, everybody has at least one eye on how it's going to benefit them politically. What is their self-interest? And certainly the Gracchi brothers identified a lot of these issues as a way to rocket themselves to the top of the political hierarchy, to make themselves truly the first men in Rome using this new, you know, using this new mode of politics. But what was the response uh, from the Senate to all of this? They rejected it. They were intransigently opposed to all manner of reform, anything that would get proposed that threatened the way things had always been done was going to be rejected. And it was rejected. And uh, there are two basic reasons why 
there was so much resistance to any effort to reform the Republic. And the first is simply that the Romans were a very small C conservative people, right? They wanted today to be like yesterday. They wanted tomorrow to be like today. They wanted to live the same way that their grandparents had lived. They wanted their grandchildren to live. They wanted that continuity. They liked that stasis, that continuity. So just the very idea of innovation and reform is gonna make them bristle, right? Especially the aristocracy. They don't want anything to change. They are doing great. Um, but the other side of it, and this pops up over and over again in the book, is that it wasn't just, oh, we resist this reform because we don't like it. It is also because if my rival gets the win, if my rival gets to take credit for passing something that is incredibly popular, then my rival is going to become incredibly popular, right? And that is bad for me because I want to be incredibly popular. I want to be powerful and so I can't let him be powerful. So like, for example, uh, the Lex Agraria that Tiberius Gracchus proposes is wildly popular. Like everybody wants this to pass. The vast majority of Roman citizens are are going to support uh, the Lex Agraria if it comes to a vote. And that's gonna make Tiberius Gracchus incredibly popular and we can't have that. Um, so they block the Lex Agraria. And what happens to Tiberius? I mean, he winds up not just blocked and shut out, he winds up dead and his body gets dumped in the Tiber. And then his brother comes along 10 years later with an even larger slate of reforms, most of which I should add, uh, anticipated the Augustan reforms and Julius Caesar's reforms by about 100 years. I mean, what Gaius Gracchus was up to was some of the most visionary political, uh, political reforms that Rome had really ever seen until Julius Caesar comes along and does it all by executive fiat, largely because Gaius Gracchus failed. Um, so the Gracchi brothers wind up dead. Their movement winds up crushed within you know, 10 or 12 years. And this then leads to a far more confrontational style of politics than had ever existed before uh, during the Republic because you, none of these problems had been solved. All of this resentful energy was still floating around out there. People still did not have the land that they needed. People still could not feed themselves. Uh, the Italians still wanted citizenship. Nothing had been addressed, but that energy is now running into a brick wall that is the senatorial aristocracy who doesn't want anything to happen. So nothing is getting done. And this leaves the field open then, not to genuine reformers, but to cynical demagogues. And the cynical demagogues who come in and identify this resentful energy as a path to power don't really care about your problems. They don't really care about solving your problems. If they do, in fact, get power after making a bunch of promises, uh, they're certainly not interested in following through on those promises because they're interested in using that energy and using you as a means to an end, as a means to their own personal power. And usually the way that it would go is they would, they would go out there and they would say, I'm gonna give you this and I'm gonna give you that and I'm gonna give you another thing. And also, by the way, the people who are to blame for all your problems are those people over there who just so happen coincidentally to be my personal enemies. So go get them. And that is how Roman politics started to go. So all of this, um, the conflict and tension between rich and poor, the conflict between the Romans and the Italians, um, this new confrontational style of politics, the cynical demagogues who have now entered the fray is gonna lead to a breakdown of most maiorum. And most maiorum is loosely translated as the way of the elders. It was the unspoken rules and unspoken norms of behavior that had previously kept most of the leadership in check. Now that it's more important to win than it is to govern, now that it's more important to deny my rival something popular instead of letting it pass, um, once that becomes more important than anything, the old way, the old comity, the old unspoken ways of doing business simply no longer applied. And the historian, the future down the road, historian Sallust, who is a partisan of Caesar's, uh, who's writing about 100 years after all of this, and he's looking back at the beginning of the end of the Roman Republic, um, has a quote, and he said, it is this spirit which has commonly ruined great nations. When one party desires to triumph over another by any and every means and to avenge itself on the vanquished with excessive cruelty. 
So everyone now cares more about winning than they do about governing. And if you take just chapter one of the book, it is a bit of a microcosm for the whole for the whole course of the rest of the book and how these little breaches of most myorum start to build and set future presidents, future presidents, future precedents. Um, <laughs> Oh, Freudian slip there. Um, Tiberius Gracchus, when he wants to introduce the Lex Agraria, the traditional way of doing things by most myorum is to first submit it to the Senate and get their considered opinion about whether or not he should bring this bill to the assembly. But Tiberius and his allies have sounded out the Senate. They know that the Senate is not gonna say, you know, this is a great bill, let's do this. Let's take our land and give it to poor people. Um, so what does Tiberius do? He takes it directly to the popular assembly without submitting it to the Senate first. This is a little breach of most my arm, it's not big. So the Senate responds by what? They basically hire a tribune to go out there and veto the reading of the Lex Agraria so it cannot even be voted on. Now this is a huge, huge breach of most my arm because the whole point of a tribune of the pleb is to be a spokesman for the people and to support what the people want. And like never before in Roman history had a tribune of the pleb stood up in the face of something that was going to be overwhelmingly popular and overwhelmingly voted in favor of and say, no, I'm just not gonna let you do that. I'm gonna use this, um, this procedural gimmick that I have called the veto to prevent you from even voting on it. So what does Tiberius Gracchus do in the face of this? Well, he says, I'm gonna veto everything, every piece of business. I'm gonna throw my seal on the temple of Saturn. No business is going to be conducted. No laws will be passed until I get what I want, which is the Lex Agraria, which is also frankly what the people want. Um, when the Tribune refuses to step down, Tiberius then deposes him from office in a majority vote. No Tribune had ever been deposed from office before. Um, so he deposes, he deposes the Tribune, he gets the Lex Agraria passed, what does the Senate do? They say, great, you passed it. You get no money to actually go out and survey the land. You get no money to pay for the lawyers. You get no money to pay for the clerks. You get nothing. Now, not a single thing that I have just mentioned is against the law at all, right? None of this is against the law. All of this was simply breaches of the way that things had always been done were now being ignored in the interest of just your own short-term political advantage. And even Tiberius Gracchus running for re-election, which he decides to do in order to further his, uh, in order to further the Lex Agraria, even that was not against written law. It was not illegal for him to do that. It was just a severe breach of most maiorum that of course then leads to the biggest breach of all, which is, you know, an armed mob running up the Capitoline Hill and beating Tiberius Gracchus and 300 followers to death and dumping their bodies in the Tiber. So that's not so great. And what happens in that, what happens to Tiberius and then what happens to his brother and these breaches of Mos Maiorum uh, lead to what Valais Patercullus, another later Roman historian writes about this, where he says, that precedents do not stop where they begin, but however narrow the path upon which they enter, they create for themselves a highway whereupon they may wander with the utmost latitude. No one thinks a course is base for himself, which has proven profitable to others. And so those little breakdowns in most my arm that are caused by increasingly confrontational politics, by all of this resentful energy that is not being addressed, clashing with intransigent resistance, leads to further precedents that are gonna be followed, further breaches of most my arm that are just gonna grow and grow and grow. To, to crush the Grokken coalition once and for all, the Senate convenes what is probably illegal, not just a breach of most my arm, it probably is illegal for them to convene a tribunal that is going to issue uh, arbitrary exile and, um, and execution orders for various people who were associated with the Grokken coalition, most of them foreigners who were living in Rome. Um, this leads 10 years later to a response from the what was left of the populari. Uh, they convened their own like quasi-revolutionary tribunals during the Jugurthine War to identify and purge uh, senators who were corrupt. I mean, most senators were corrupt, uh, but who they, pointed their, uh, who they pointed these tribunals at were a lot of the people who were involved in the crushing of the Grokken coalition. So now you're into cycles of vengeance, right? Now you're into like some Hatfields and McCoy stuff where it almost becomes like nobody knows who started it. We just know who did the last thing. Um, the early, you know, the early success using using armed 
armed clashes to get your way, right? Where, where you have su just supporters spontaneously coming together and fighting off some rival coalition or some rival party. Um, once that proves effective, then you see leaders start to organize uh, official you know, uh, armed gangs who are swordsmen who are on retainer. Uh, Sulpicius Rufus, eventually by the end of the book, right, has his anti-Senate, which is 300 armed men who he can just dispatch in any direction he feels like. I don't want that bill to pass, so I'm just going to send my guys into the forum. I'm going to break up the voting stalls. I'm going to kick over the voting urns, and that vote is simply not going to take place. And what are you going to do about it? You're going to stop me? Well, maybe because the next step down the road is now you have not just armed gangs who have been organized, you're talking about whole armies that are now being deployed in the interest not of defending Rome or in fighting some foreign war, but in prosecuting domestic politics. Marius is leading armies, Sulla is leading armies in the interest of their own political, uh, in their own political interests. And this is, this is not great. This is not great for the Roman Republic to have armies throwing themselves at each other. And the end of the book really culminates with Sulla, of course, emerging victorious in the Civil War. And in the midst of that, you have young Pompey, young Pom Pompey the Great, um, young Pompey the Great is running around chasing down the enemies of Sulla, and he winds up in Sicily. And he's issuing arbitrary execution orders from this little tribunal, and some magistrates approach him and say, you know, this is illegal what you're doing. And, and of course it was illegal what he was doing. This is not a breach of most myorum. Um, Pompey did not have a magistracy. He had not been voted into anything. He was like 22 years old. Um, he's a private citizen acting on behalf of Sulla who is arbitrarily murdering Roman citizens. And what does Pompey say in reply to this? He says, cease quoting laws to those of us with swords. And that is kind of the ball game. Right? Because as it turns out, even following a written law, even following a written constitution is itself merely an unspoken custom. It's merely a norm, right? We give these laws power over us. We give the constitution power over us, you know, the same way that we imbibe uh, value into, you know, pieces of paper that we carry around in our wallet or just like now it's just like digits, like in a mainframe somewhere. Um, and if you decide you don't want to follow the law anymore, the only thing stopping you is the force of the state. But if you can muster more force than the state can muster, if you can muster more force than the force that is behind the written law, then that written law has no power over you. And force now becomes the defining, uh, the defining issue of, of, of establishing power. And when... Pompey said that, I think more than, more than any other little moment in the long and slow and oftentimes violent collapse of the Roman Republic is when he says that, cease quoting laws to those of us with swords. That right there is really the end of the beginning of the end of the Roman Republic, and it is the beginning of the end of the end of the Roman Republic, and that is going to be the end of the end of this little talk. So thank you very much. So we can do, we've got time for questions. Uh, we've probably got, well, like 15 minutes or so to do some questions. I think there is a microphone, hey, Hey, man. I'm saying hi to Ames. He doesn't know that I'm saying hi to him. Hey, hey man. <laughs> you too. Yeah, we'll, we'll let him, we'll let him, let, it, let, him, let him lead the, the charge. <laughs> yeah. the, this had better be good, man. I am going to try. Okay. Uh, so the, the, the overwhelming story I get, not just from this talk, but from the book as well, is that um, norm breaking begets norm breaking begets violence begets the end of anything good. Um, What's the escape valve? And not pitched just to you know the, those of you who have played the game and won, um, but what's the what's the way out of that? Um, where, what's the point of no return where you can steer away from that sort of policy? <sighs> <laughs> um, I think it partly needs to there there needs to be some of the breaches that have occurred need to be repaired by the people who did the breaching. Um, 
I don't think like we're, we're dealing with a situation right now, I think a little bit where there is one party is doing a little bit more norm breaking than the other. And there's a lot of pressure on the party not doing the norm breaking to hold the norms together. Like you have to be the ones who hold on to it. But this does create a little bit of like a Harlem Globetrotters, uh, Washington generals situation where the, where the Washington generals are expected to play by the rules and the Harlem Globetrotters are allowed to do whatever they want. Um, so if you take, if you take something like, like there, like one very specific example that you can point to right now today that is a that has been a clear breach of American Most Myorum was withholding the hearings on Merrick Garland. Okay, that was, you know, it wasn't against the law, right? I mean, they, it says right in the Constitution, advise and consent, right? They had the votes, right? If the Senate is not going to consent, it's right there in the Constitution that says that they cannot consent if they don't feel like it, and so they held the seat open for a year. And then they won the election and then they got their seat. Um, the problem is that this has now created, I think, a new precedent where it's going to be virtually impossible for a party that controls the presidency but not the Senate to ever get a nominee through and a, a party that controls the Senate but not the presidency to ever let a nominee through. I mean, there's enormous pressure. There's going to be enormous pressure to do it, but it's been proven to work and the, the, the um, the precedent has been set. So I think it would really take specifically the Republicans in the Senate allowing a Democrat's nominee through or the other way around. I think that's how it needs to be repaired. It's incumbent upon the people who did the breaching um, to fix it. Yes, sir. These guys are all cool. Don't worry about them. Okay, so the question is, if one political faction has a, an armed gang that is running around doing what it is that they want to do, uh, what, what if there's another armed gang that's going to come in that wants the opposite, right? What if they're going to fight against it? Well, that's um, the beginning of the end of the Roman Republic. <laughs> um, that's, that's what happens. I mean, once you, once you get past um, the storm before the storm, you know, the gangs between, you know, Milo and, um, oh God, what's the other guy's name? I forget now. Clodius, thank you. Why did I forget Clodius? Sorry. Um, then it becomes, it's a, it's a struggle of brute strength. It's who literally whoever wins the fight then is going to be the ones who win. It's, it's just a fight between people. There's no politics involved in it anymore and whoever wins is gonna win. That's really the, the nut of the problem. Yes. Trump. In the book Feared by Donald Trump, Steve Bannon is quoted as saying that in Trump he has another Gracchi brother. My question, no. my, question is, my question is what is he smoking? Because <laughs> there's, there's no way in how, so how does he make that leap? How do you think he makes that leap? How does Bannon, Bannon make that leap? Yeah. Okay, so the question is, is Trump the Gracchi? No, I wrote a whole op-ed about it actually. It's sitting, it's sitting on my server. We should probably now get that um, to the New York Times. <laughs> so what what Bannon's basic point is is that the Gracchi brothers represented the, uh, uh, a power of the people who is going to overthrow a corrupt aristocracy, which he's identifying as the global you know economic elite. Which you know he's not wrong about that. Um, what he's wrong about is what Trump is compared to what the Gracchi actually were and what they actually did. He's taking a very superficial reading of what the Gracchi brothers were and sort of grafting it onto a story that he wants to tell about Trump and why Trump has risen and what is driving Trump. Um, I, I wish I had this. I could read the whole thing to you. There was like four, there was like four different things that um, make Trump not the Gracchi brothers. For one, when the Gracchi brothers came into power, they had a plan. <laughs> Okay, Gaius Gracchus, Gaius Gracchus had been, and this, I mean, this is a joke, but it's not really a joke. When Gaius Gracchus came to power, he had clearly been working on a set of reform proposals for like 10 years. Like they had thought it through. They thought through how they were going to get it passed. They thought through um, how the logistical mechanics of it were going to work. Um, 
they had a real plan. Uh, when they then got into power, they were actually pretty effective getting their reforms passed. Now, it ran, both of them obviously ran into trouble eventually, but Gaius Gracchus got his entire slate of reforms passed. I mean, Donald Trump has not been the most effective legislature, uh, legislator that we've ever seen. I don't think he's, he vaunts himself as a great deal maker, but it's, it's hard to see in practice. Um, gosh, what was the other thing? Right, they were genuine reformers who cared actually about um, the people that he was ostensibly representing. So it's one of these things where it's, it's a very superficial comparison that he wants to make um, to give Trump some, uh, some historical credibility and some historical aura that I don't really think holds up under much scrutiny. Let's do somebody, let's do somebody in the back. Oh, we'll do you right there, yes. Um, sorry, you said that this uh, period has been very understudied and we don't have like the TV show of the Gracchi brothers and Marius and Sola or anything like that right. yet. Um, yet. But my question is like, especially in like the academic field where they've presumably had time to study all of these different periods and run out of things to say about other periods. Uh, did, were there any like historians that you found particularly helpful in putting together this book or any new interpretations that, that uh, you found particularly helpful? Right. So one of the things that I did discover uh, in writing the book is that even even really um, academic histories of the, especially like political histories of the late Roman Republic, like the journal articles, they just like die out around 1980. Um, there's, there's a lot of, there's a ton of stuff from the fifties, from the sixties, from the seventies. But once, uh, there is a, a move towards revisionism in, in the, the long-term historiography of, of Western civilization and the move towards more social history and a focus on, uh, slaves, a focus on, uh, what, what, uh, what women were doing, uh, in Roman society, um, those issues began to take over from just these sort of high-end, um, top-line political debates. So most of the historians that I was working from and trying to put this together, most of it, like Eric Gruen is a guy who was phenomenally helpful, who wrote a lot about Roman law and the Roman courts. You know, he, he's been dead for 20 years. So part of, part of what this is, it's a little bit of a revival of more classic, um, just a straight political take, an economic take, as opposed to social history, which, you know, if you Google the Gracchi in, um, in like JSTOR, it's just like there's, no, there's like two things after, um, after like 1985. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, so this is a question about economics. So I think uh, a lot of the, <laughs> in the behind the beginning of the uh, Roman Republic has to do with um, economic strain, classified, et cetera. Um, and a lot of solutions put forward were confrontational. Uh, people, you know, forgave their own interests or be the interests of those who they saw as their constituents. But did any of these political actors have sort of coherent theories of economy in the way that we understand it as moderns today, or were they really just reacting to political realities? Okay, so the question is basically, um, I'll reframe it so that I can answer it. Um, <laughs> Did, did these Roman leaders have coherent theories of economics that were helping to drive um, their policies the way that most political parties and most leaders do today? There's at least some sort of coherent economic theory that's driving most leaders. And I would say, honestly, like, no. Um, most of this is pretty ad hoc and boiled down to, like, you know, these guys, they used to have land and now they don't because everybody else, you know, these other guys have bought all the land and we should try to fix that somehow. But no, they, they weren't working from like a labor theory of value and knowing that, you know, like X amount of uh, land was going to produce this or that. Um, so most of it was um, pretty spontaneous and pretty, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, improvised, right? A lot of it was very improvised. Uh, with the glasses, that's there. Everybody has glasses. We all have glasses. Why would I say, why would I say, uh, Dylan? Hey, hi, Dylan. Hey, man. Hey, how's it going? Uh, so you in revolutions have read a lot about, um, parliamentary regimes that have kind of fallen apart and fallen apart into civil wars. And with Rome and America, we're kind of talking about a strong executive system. Do you think that strong executive versus parliamentary is a useful axis to think about, um, you know, when you play these constitutional hardball games about is one system, is one side of the spectrum more resistant to falling apart or 
is the strong because there's a lot of theory that strong executives make things fall apart faster. Right. So it you can you can pull up examples either way, right? I mean, you can you can pull up examples of parliamentary systems uh, that can't form uh, single party governments that are so that get so caught up in uh, multi-party coalition politics that the national government becomes very destabilized and becomes it becomes easier for a small faction to exert more power. One thing I will say is that when the United States of America, uh, let's say after World War One, after World War II, when we become one of these like dominant international players and there are new democracies that are being set up, the nobody that the State Department would send out was like recommending the American system of government, right? We're like when even like when we conquered Iraq, and we said, okay, you need a new system of government, and it would be nice if it was stable. We didn't say like you need a president and you need a House of Representatives and you need a Senate. Um, so it, I th I think it is true that a strong executive can be destabilizing. Um, but at the same time, a strong executive is able to get things done in a way that sometimes uh, a parliamentary system there's can't get done because the executive has the ability to do that. There is, I think, a very long-term danger for the United States in how powerful the presidency has become, certainly starting with, uh, let's say, Theodore Roosevelt and running all through the 20th century. is just a long history of the congressional branch abdicating responsibility after responsibility after. I mean, we haven't declared a war since like 1942. What is that about? Um, so whatever whatever checks and balances existed inside the American system are starting to get swamped by the supremacy of um, of the executive branch, and so do, you know, do I really have a good answer to is a, is a parliamentary system more resistant to collapse and revolution than a than a than a presidential system? I don't know if if collapse necessarily. It's probably more resistant to uh, fascism. Because you know, a strong executive is simply there to take over, which is also the end of a republic. Okay, next question. Hi, Mike. Thanks for coming. Hey, thank you for coming. <laughs> Thanks for not going to see Lin Manuel Miranda. <laughs> you guys are all peaches. He's he's like right over there. <laughs> he's some he's somewhere in here. He's in the building. No, I didn't. I haven't even met him yet. So it seems that uh, in the book, you sort of set up as a necessary precondition to the fall of the republic political violence. Mm -hmm. The question is, do you think we're dawning or we're close to political violence in our system, or is this question even analogous to the United States? Politi so has political violence entered into the United States in the same way that it was entering into the Roman Republic? I God, I mean, like, if you'd asked me that question two years ago, I would have said no. Um, I don't think that we're there yet. We're certainly, you, there are different forms of political violence, right? There is, um, there's top-down political violence, which is like the ruling classes um, beating and murdering, you know, people who are going to stand against their own power. That, we've had a lot of that in our history. Most states have had that form of political violence. Um, is there bottom up political violence, sort of like revolutionary style? Like, yeah, sure, there, we've had a lot of that. I mean, in the 1970s, God, there was, like a, there was like a bomb every day, practically, I think on average, like through most of the 70s, like what the weathermen were doing. Um, that's a form of political violence. What we haven't really had though in American history too much, except for like that one little incident in 1860, um, is just a little blip on the radar, um, is two roughly equal political factions or political parties utilizing force and utilizing uh, violence to triumph over their rival. We actually have not had much of that in American history. Okay, so right now we're at this very moment, not when I wrote the book, which was a couple years ago, but now, yeah, you start to see, you know, like what happened with the Proud Boys here, right? We, we saw that. That was politically motivated violence. Um, and then the, uh, the Republicans will identify Antifa as, as, a, as a little gang of armed thugs who are going around um, beating people up for their political ends. What we haven't quite seen, but it's getting distressingly close, is... Um, 
the more respectable leadership and respectable parties, like openly associating with those and having like organizational ties to like, like the thugs or to an armed gang. I don't think we quite have that yet. If we go over that line, this is all still pretty spontaneous, but if we go over that line and actual political leaders, senators or members of the house or the president start to really say like, yeah, come on down and, you know, bring your gun. Um, and let's, let's beat these people up. I mean, cause Trump said during the campaign, like, yeah, we used to be able to rough these people up and we used to be able to beat them up. And there was a little bit of it, but like su surprisingly little, you know, for as bad as that could have gotten as bad as a major party candidate saying, yeah, let's kick the crap out of protesters. It didn't actually get much beyond one or two incidents. It was actually surprisingly docile. Um, but we do keep sort of moving in that direction in a very distressing way. So I hope nobody was planning on leaving here feeling good about the future. <laughs> yes, sir. I need a microphone. I cannot hear. I cannot hear the question. All right. Let's give this another try. Uh, do you think there's an institution from uh, a modern American democracy that you would put into the republic to try and stabilize it, or vice versa, a republican institution that would maybe help stabilize things in modern America? Oh, is there an institution that I would put into... The, the, the Roman Republic from the American system that would help stabilize it a little bit. Um, honestly, a little bit, I always thought they went overboard on the whole one year and one year only in power thing. Um, I think that was often counterproductive uh, in a way that it maybe shouldn't have been and the whole like you can't ever run for reelection even after a single year um, was probably not the best idea because there's only so many good leaders out there and very often good leaders were pitched after 12 months uh, and bad leaders then came along um so i think that ex i think we we did a we did a pretty good job balancing what what a term is supposed to be you know you, you should have some time without it being permanent and without it being just like a nanosecond so they could they could have probably use some longer terms of office and what what did they have um that we could use? Oh, Tribune to the plebs would probably not be the worst thing in the world um, at this point. Somebody who's just there to only represent um, the citizens as opposed to the, the powerful structures that exist above them. I don't know. Their republic collapsed, so I'm not really gonna go rooting through. I'm not really gonna go rooting through looking for parts to use to save ourselves. Okay, how many, how many more questions can I take, do we think? Take maybe one or two more. Okay, we'll do two more. Yes, sir. Um, how much do you think that the founding fathers, okay, that's much better. much better. How much do you think that the founding fathers, a uh, good reading of the classics and instituting what they thought were good ideas and bad ideas that they saw through history, sort of have so, to some degree immunized us from some of the bad decisions and bad routes that the Roman Republic went down and makes some of the analogy not work so well or still works just fine? Well, I think that the guys who were putting together the Constitution had a fairly above average understanding of <laughs> Roman history and Greek history and did use that to their advantage. I mean, you, you talk about a group of guys who did try to at least learn from the mistakes that had been made and to try to avert what they were afraid of. I mean, they, Hamilton, of course, very famously identified a cynical populist demagogue as one of the greatest threats to any republic. And they did build in these checks and balances to try to prevent any one person from acquiring power. And what they, what they really hoped was that there would be institutional checks and balances too, because they didn't, because the one of the things that I think they missed um, Maybe on purpose, it's it's still kind of baffling that they never put together that there were going to be organized political parties, which could have been um, a sort of a downside to focusing on classical forms of Republican government because the Romans never had parties. I mean, even if we talk about the populari, the optimate, this is all like just families and leaders um, sort of running into each other. 
So they hoped that there would be these institutional checks that do get swamped once one party is like, I'm going to control all of the branches of government. Now there's now there's no checks and balances left. But they certainly used Polybius. I mean, they, they read their Polybius and they knew what uh, what it meant to try to balance different forms of government. And the American Republic, um, such as it was created in 1789, still continues to exist today. And that's a pretty good run. It's a better run than, for example, the French, who are on, I believe, their 19th Republic um, <laughs> since the French Revolution. Uh, so in that sense, it has been pretty permanent. And I do and I do still believe, just for the record, that the Republic has not fallen, right? I don't think that we are living under a dictatorship. Um, I don't think Franklin Roosevelt was a dictator. I don't think Obama was a dictator. I don't think George W. Bush was a dictator. Um, we still have elections. Elections do still matter. Elections still do do still work. And as much as, you know, you can see it being massaged into a tyrannical direction, I, we're not there yet by a long shot. Um, okay. So I will do one more question in the very back blue shirt. Yeah. You're looking behind you. There you go. Let's do it. This is it for all the marbles. So you were saying that, uh, Whoa, how'd he get the mic? All right. We're going to do two more and then I'm going to have you answer. Uh, I'm going to have you answer. All right, let's, let's do it. Um, if force does become the, you know, most important thing, in politics, do you think we're good just because of the size of the U.S. military and the strength of the U.S. military? Um, I surprisingly look to the United States military as a stabilizing influence on the American Republic. Um, I believe that the way that the U.S. military currently operates is through a single paymaster uh, paid for by the national taxpayers. Uh, so one awesome thing that we are not really dealing with, you know, Eric Prince aside, um, and though that gang of lunatics, is that what the Romans were doing, what allowed them to, for this force to continue to build and continue to build is the control of personal armies, right? Where you were going out and you were recruiting your own armies. Those men were dependent upon you being victorious for them to get paid, right? And this is something that Augustus solved. This Augustus put a stop to that by creating regional mints and by having all the pay of the legions really coming out of the central government rather than from the individual commanders. And I think that the United States military being constructed in a more on, a, on an Augustan model as opposed to Marius and Sulla who have to go out and win wars in order to bring spoils home, I think that that inoculates the US military in a major way from ever being put to use by one single political leader. And I I've know enough active duty military personnel and officers and people who were veterans of these various wars that most of them don't think that there's much in the US military, especially in the army and in the Marines that can be directed in a political direction in that way, especially the officers. Um, I just, it's, it's, it's actually much more apolitical and balanced than a lot of people often think it is. Okay, last question. Here it comes. Okay, uh, so given uh, that the advanced military technology is possessed by lots of countries nowadays, especially nuclear armed states, do you think violent revolution can ever be successful nowadays? Can violent revolution ever be successful nowadays um, because of the technologies, what the, like, the state forces can deploy against them? Sure. Yeah, I think it could be done. Um, I would prefer not, <laughs> okay? Um, I know I write a show called Revolutions. Uh, I'm interested in revolutions. I've, I'm interested in all kinds of revolutions. I find them interesting. I do not find them attractive. Um, but there are things that even small groups can do to disrupt the state's ability to deploy those forces. I mean, if you can shut down uh, communication lines, if you can, if you can crash uh, the internet, for example, now all of your fancy toys don't actually work anymore. Um, I mean, most of the people in power right now, like if, if you just locked them out of their Gmail, they would be lost. They wouldn't have any idea who to talk to or who to call about it. Um, so there are, I, I, there are, I definitely think, creative ways to disrupt the powers that be that might prevent them from ever utilizing in a large way, the weapon. So, you, but you got to do that first. I mean, you can't just go charging at the White House with um, bricks, 
right now and expect that to work, you're going to meet a buzzsaw of like drone missiles. Okay. So on that cheery note, <laughs> thank you very much for coming. Um, I will sit over here.